we mustn't be caught by surprise by our own advancing technology. This has happened again and again in history. Technology has advanced and this changes social conditions. And suddenly people have found themselves in a situation which they didn't foresee and doing all sorts of things they didn't really want to do. Well, now, what do you mean? Do you mean that we, we develop our television but we don't know how to use it correctly? Is that the point that you're making? Well, at present, the television, I think, is being used uh, quite harmlessly. It's being used, I think, uh, I would feel it's being used too much to distract everybody all the time. But, I mean, imagine, which must be the situation in all communist countries where the television, where it exists, is always saying the same thing the whole time, is always driving along. It's not creating a wide front of distraction, it's creating a one-pointed uh, drumming in of a single idea all the time. It's obviously an immensely powerful instrument. America, a vast cultural complex churning out idea after idea with factory-like precision. Today, the average American is subjected daily to thousands of messages fired his way. The mind is now softwired to the constant flow of information and perceptions manufactured at will. Man becomes diverted from his natural course and instead becomes a consumer, an economic unit, a living, breathing, industrial resource. It is strange to think that not so long ago, we lived in a world free of advertising. Beyond the dreams of his ancestors, modern man has molded the earth to his liking. Proud of his vast creative ability, he can boast of the grandeur of his achievement and admire the scope of his own imagination. Yet none can deny that man's progress in material things is today at its highest peak. In an industrial age, the worker has achieved through technological advances a level of production never dreamed of at the beginning of the century. In that sense, the problem of capitalism is not mass production that's been solved. The problem of capitalism instead is the problem of consumption. So central is consumption to its survival and growth that at the end of the 19th century, industrial capitalism invented a unique new institution. That institution was the advertising industry. To ensure the immense accumulation of, of commodities, the immense collection of commodities, are converted back into a money form. Now if you want to understand the modern world, if you want to understand where we're headed, where we are right now, and you don't put an analysis of advertising and this commercial culture at its center, you're designed to be in ignorance of what drives us. This discourse has seeped into our consciousness and our imaginations. From a diamond is forever to a world where more kids can recognize Joe Camel and Ronald McDonald than Mickey Mouse and Santa Claus where the golden arches are more recognizable than the Christian cross. This commercial discourse is the ground on which we live. This commercial discourse is the space in which we learn to think, the lens through which we come to understand the world that surrounds us. The emergence of the commercial culture, the space where mass production and mass culture interact, coincided with the industrial boom of the early 20th century and the desire to align consumer demand with the growing supply of products now flooding the marketplace. The ability to control consumer behavior spawned an entirely new industry, one whose central aim was to manipulate the tastes and habits of entire populations. Maxwell House coffee tastes as good as it smells every time. If Elites like soon discovered that by tapping into the psychology of mass society, they could do much more than just sell products. They could sell entire ideologies. 
The merchandising of products soon gave way to the merchandising of ideas, underscored by an evolution in the way in which information was packaged and dispensed to the masses, where in the past ideas were pounded into people's heads. Today, they are skillfully grafted into the public psyche. Spearheading this movement was an American publicist of Austrian descent named Edward Bernays. By adopting a modern approach to advertising through his extensive study of psychoanalysis, Bernays became the darling of corporate titans and political leaders alike. He is credited with popularizing smoking among women, being the first to use celebrity testimonials to sell products, and for developing the propaganda campaign behind the U.S.'s overthrow of the democratically elected Guatemalan government in the 1950s. Driven by a deep skepticism of the masses, which he viewed as a dangerous, irrational herd, Bernays was an open proponent for social manipulation for the purpose of opinion molding, a technique he referred to as the engineering of consent. In his most famous work, a book entitled Propaganda, Bernays stated that, quote, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. You go back into 1923, and the man who designed and worked with all presidents, a whole bunch of presidents, one after another, a man who helped design the League of Nations, and, and attended the first conference with Wilson at the age of 23. Yeah, it was Bernays, and, and he said this in his own book. It's the guy who gave you the consumer society, uh, taught women to smoke and drink beer and behave uh, rather raunchily, we shall say. He said, invisible power is now in control of every aspect of American life. Democracy is only a front for skillful wire pulling tricks the new sciences of mental manipulation could place at the disposal of politicians and policy people for a price.